Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. We welcome you again to Sunday School. Uh, this is being recorded today. We are actually meeting live by Zoom, and you can join that anytime you'd like. That information is in our church bulletin. It's also on our church website. But today, our lesson is the birth of Moses, beginning with Exodus, the second chapter, and the first 10 verses. This is a part of our three-unit study about God's exceptional choice. Unit one was all about the line of Abram and Abraham as, as he was called of God to be the father of many nations. But you, what we're learning in this unit, although that we're, we're galloping through history, what we're learning is that God's hand saw all of it through. Even though it was hundreds of years, the reality was God never went back on his promise things changed probably wasn't the way he wanted it to be well clearly it wasn't go back to the garden of eden but the fact of the matter is god wanted his people to prosper and so this first unit that we went through in september was the call of abram himself then god chooses the younger twin then jacob called israel and the scepter was given to judah when we had the live lesson last sunday at 10 o'clock at the church um, we talked a little bit about how hard last week's lesson was. I didn't necessarily think it was a hard lesson because it was pretty simple. It was everything was out of control, but God had it. Um, but the thing that came up in the 10 o'clock class was we talked about the fact that that it just didn't seem right that Judah would con get to continue to the line when he was such um a difficult person he didn't necessarily show his faith but it was in god's grander plan um and i think it's kind of fitting that we move into this next unit where the guy's not always in charge this one is this week's is about women we start unit two out of slavery to nationhood and the with the birth of moses what's happening here across these three units is um, the authors of the lessons are trying to take us from the beginning of time to salvation and to do that across three months is pretty hard so we have to we have to get on the back of this horse and just ride because it we do have to jump around the chronology sometimes is baffling because like this this week's lesson we are jumping 400 years from last week's so it, it really is um you have to not get hung up with the history of it all. The key text today, she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. So the background of this lesson is, you know, Abram or Abraham now was promised his descendants would be numerous. You remember he had been a nomad there. He didn't really have place. They just kind of wondered at the beginning, but they were promised Canaan, and that was going to be a place where they could reside, and that it was going to be, he was going to be the father of many nations. We go through, we jump around the line, and we get to Joseph, and Joseph was taken from his ancestral land to Egypt, and he became in high regard. He brought his family to Egypt. So let's see if we remember all that. You know, Jacob had the 12 sons and the daughter. You remember that? And Joseph was the son that got put into the pit by his brothers. And then he was, he was rescued and he was taken to Egypt and he became of high regard. And he brought then all of the, the descendants, which was at that point about 70. Um, to Egypt, and then they prospered in Egypt. Well, why did they prosper in Egypt? They were still the Israelites. They still believed what they believed. But in Egypt, because of Joseph and because of all the good things he did through the famine, um, that they were sort of tolerated. Even though the Egyptians were pagan, 
they the Isra Israelites were tolerated because they had done some good. But centuries later, we're talking about over 400 years from Joseph. There were a whole lot of Israelites. Those 70 were prolific. So God's promise to Abraham was being fulfilled, that they were his people. But boy, what a mess over time. All of the things that have transpired in the history of the Old Testament to now, to, this, to today's lesson, get us to the point where God's still with them. There are a bunch of them, but they're not in the promised land. They are in Egypt. So after about 430 years, the new Pharaoh didn't know anything about Joseph. He hadn't learned his history lessons. It didn't make any difference about Joseph or anything, but he is alarmed at how many Israelites there are. And he doesn't really have any control over the Israelites because they're not his people. And so he made it a rule that the Israelites were to be laborers or slave masters. Now the Israelites, most of them had prospered by working. So it's not like they were going from the lap of luxury to something else. No, they had been hard laborers anyway, but now they were being put under the rule of Egyptian masters. So they served essentially as slaves. And then he says, we got to curb this population. He declared that every Hebrew boy that was born must be thrown into the Nile. But God's blessing is still out there. That promise is still out there. Jacob's descendants were supposed to be God's people. Well, how can that happen if they're slaves and we're killing all the babies? So how could that happen? And that's where we come to the lesson today. Many of these Hebrew babies survived infancy. If you look in Exodus 1, after what we're talking about today, many of the Hebrew women actually saved their children somehow, their boy children. But something as simple as birth and bringing up the children was a way that God was to continue in this unjust situation. Now, I think we're going to pause here for just a second, folks, because sometimes we get so hung up on the unjust things that are happening around us that we don't see the blessings, that we don't see what's actually happening that's good because the bad is so bad. And I think particularly in these times, that's true. But today's lesson is about how one of those survival stories happened and how God used it. Exodus 2, beginning with verse 1. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. Now Levi, you remember, is one of Jacob's sons. And so remember the 12 tribes, so that's how they get to be that. They're not the priestly group yet, but this is the, the line that will be the priestly group. It's important that we know that they are, they are Levites just simply for the context of history. It doesn't say in Exodus 2 what their names were, but they were Amram and Jochebed. And I'll just give you a, an aside here because I just think it's interesting. Back when the game Trivia, per, Trivial Pursuit came about, um, and it was just such a big rave with young teachers for whatever reason. And I was young at the time. This probably was in the 70s. My team won because the last question was Moses' mother's name, and I happened to know it. I've always been fascinated by Jochebed, so I will not forget her because she helped us win Trivia Pursuit. Okay, that's the aside. But what's important is God used a Levite man and his wife. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Now, Moses was not an only child. You remember from your study of, of uh, the Bible up to now is, uh, you know, Aaron and Miriam play a role later on. But for the 
at this particular point in time, we only are talking about Miriam and then Moses. Um, I think it's important that we also see that this is not a Jesus salvation kind of pregnancy. This is a man and woman got married and then she became pregnant. So this is humankind, but was it was certainly God ordained. Verse three, but when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for, for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. So the baby gets too big for them to just keep in the house. How big that was, we don't know exactly. It was some months, um, probably about three. Some of the translations actually say that. But what she did, remember the women had been told that they were to throw their babies into the Nile. So they sort of comply. They just don't throw them in uh, alone by himself. They put him in a papyrus basket that was held together with pitch and turpentine. Um, and the, um, I don't mean that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a North Carolina Naval store, tar, pitch, and turpentine. <laughs> that's funny, tar and pitch. You put that together and, and essentially it would float. But Miriam, having put the baby in the water, hides back in the bulrushes. The other thing, too, is she put him in the bulrushes so that he's not just floating down the Nile. This mom and this sister wanted this baby to live. But she knew that she had to comply with the law. And she knew that something needed to happen. So. This was their ingenuity. Verse five, then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. That's interesting, isn't it? The, the, did Moses' mama know that Pharaoh's daughter went to the Nile every day to bathe? We don't know that. We don't. The Bible doesn't tell us that the, she always has slaves and that they go walking along the riverbank. We don't know that. This is another one of those beautiful situations God uses. This is the time. And when she sees it, the, the servants, her attendants, say to her, you know, what do we do with this? She opens it and the baby cries. Then Moses' sister, he's not Moses yet, by the way. Uh, Jochebed didn't name him that. But then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? So Miriam comes out of the bulrushes and says, can I help you with this? And guess what the princess does then? She says, yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got, and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. So what's happened here? One thing is that the princess, who is the king's daughter, is the only one who's going to be able to get away with trying to save a Hebrew baby. So is God at work because the Pharaoh loves God? No, God's at work. The situation was what it was. The fact that this woman, compassionate woman, sees this baby and says and responds to Miriam, why, yes, why don't you go get this, get somebody to help nurse this baby for me and then bring him to me? So She's not unselfish in all of this, but she's compliant with a Hebrew person. And these are people now considered to be slaves. How could this be? So again, I think we have to pause and say, thank you, Lord, for using people that we don't think you can. Because clearly, she's on the side of the Pharaoh. 
in verse 10, and when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. So here's the really neat thing about this. Jochebed gets to raise her son to a certain age. We don't know how far, but obviously it was past the time of nursing. And then the Pharaoh's daughter accepts him as her son, her son, and she names him Moses. What do we know about Moses' upbringing to that point? Well, we don't know a lot, except we don't because we don't know how long um, his mom actually had him or why the Pharaoh's daughter wanted him. What do we know about Pharaoh's daughter? Very little other than she was Pharaoh's daughter. And that's the significant thing. Her father was cruel. So how on earth did she get by with this? She got by with it because she was Pharaoh's daughter. So who are the heroines of this story? I think Pharaoh's daughter was brave, certainly, but she didn't have God's plan in mind. Miriam and Jochebed would have to be the heroines of this story because they took a risk, but they trusted God and they took bold action. So what does it say to us? God provides justice where injustice reigns. Let that sit. God is just in injustice. When we are surrounded by clear injustice for those who do not have or have less or are different, God somehow provides. He invites his people to reflect his character by taking bold and risky steps to protect and care for the vulnerable. That's another one of those powerful things that is a huge lesson today. God expects his children to reflect his love. And so could Miriam and Jochebed have been in really serious trouble? Yes, but God used their faith to take bold action. The justice God requires is active, it's embodied, and it's not a made up story. It's not something else, it is the thing. God requires us to be bold. Let us pray. God of justice, we ask that you strengthen our compassion to respond to the vulnerable members of our community. Show us how we might be instruments of your justice and peace to those who experience injustice. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.